This is Space Time, Series 21, Episode 13. Coming up on Space Time, New Horizons' next target might have a moon. Has the Super Collider found its first hints of a quasi-particle? And 11 new stellar streams discovered in the Milky Way. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. There's growing speculation that the next target for NASA's New Horizons spacecraft might be a little bit unusual. After its historic first ever flyby of the dwarf planet Pluto, its binary partner Sharon, and their system of four small moons, New Horizons has continued to venture further out, deeper into the Kuiper Belt, aiming for a close encounter with a tiny world of 2014 MU69 on New Year's Day 2019. But early observations of the 45-kilometre-wide space rock in preparation for the New Horizons flyby have raised some interesting questions about its unusual shape. Astronomers think it's either extremely peanut-shaped, or alternatively, it's actually composed of two separate bodies orbiting each other, either another binary system like Pluto and Charon, or more like the Earth-Moon system, with one small body orbiting a larger one. The problem is, MU69 is 1.6 billion kilometres beyond Pluto, making observations from Earth incredibly difficult. A New Horizons science team member, Mark Buey, from the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado, thinks MU69 may well have a small moon. The problem is, scientists really won't know what MU69 looks like until the spacecraft gets there. But even from afar, the more they examine it, the more interesting and puzzling this tiny little world becomes. The data that led to these hints about MU69's nature were gathered over six weeks in June and July last year, when the New Horizons team made three attempts to place telescopes in the narrow shadow of MU69 as it passed in front of a background star. The most valuable recon came on July the 17th, when five telescopes deployed by the New Horizons team in Argentina were in just the right place at the right time to catch this fleeting shadow, an event known as an occultation, in the process, capturing important data on MU69's size, shape and orbit. It was that data which raised the possibility that MU69 may well be two like-sized objects, another binary system. The prospect that MU69 might have a moon arose from data collected during a separate occultation on July the 10th. That was carried out by SOFIA, NASA's Airborne Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, in reality a specially modified Boeing 747 airliner. Focused on MU69's expected location while flying over the Pacific Ocean, SOFIA detected what appeared to be a very short dropout in the star's light. Buey says further analysis of that data, including syncing it to MU69 orbital calculations provided by the European Space Agency's Gaia mission, opens the possibility that the blip SOFIA detected may well be another object orbiting around MU69. A binary with a smaller moon might also help explain the shift scientists detected in the position of MU69 during these occultations. The New Horizons flyby next year will be the most distant in the history of space exploration. Ancient Kuiper Belt object MU69 discovered back in 2014 is more than 6.5 billion kilometres from Earth. The Kuiper Belt itself is a ring of icy worlds, comets and frozen debris circling the Sun beyond the orbit of Neptune. And like other objects in the Kuiper Belt, MU69 offers a close-up look at the remnants of the ancient planet-building process, small worlds that hold crucial clues about the formation of the outer solar system. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Physicists believe they may have found the first tantalising hints for the existence of quasi-particles called odorons. The findings, reported on the pre-press physics website archive.org, are based on subatomic particle collisions undertaken at the Large Hadron Collider, the world's largest atom smasher. The new findings give fresh detail to the standard model of particle physics, the widely accepted physics theory explaining how the basic building blocks of matter interact. This new research isn't breaking the standard model, but rather shining a light on one of its more opaque regions. Physicists have been imagining the existence of the odoron for many decades. 
But until the Large Hadron Collider began operating at its highest energies of 13 tera electron volts in 2015, the Erdogan remained nothing more than mere conjecture. One of the study's authors, Professor Christoph Royon from the University of Kansas, says scientists have been looking for this particle since the 1970s, and until now the Erdogan had only ever been theorised to exist. The new findings concern hadrons, a family of subatomic particles that include protons and neutrons, which themselves are composed of elementary particles called quarks that are held together by force particles called gluons. These particular experiments involved collisions in which the protons remained intact after the collision. In all previous experiments, scientists detected collisions involving only even numbers of gluons exchanged between different protons. But in this new paper, researchers using more energy and observing collisions with more precision than ever before are reporting potential evidence of an odd number of gluons and without any quarks exchanged in the collisions. The authors say until now, most models involved pairs of gluons, always an even number, 2, 4, 6, 8 and so on. However, this new research is showing measurements which are incompatible with this traditional model, suggesting odd numbers of gluons are also possible. The odoron can be seen as the total contribution coming from all types of odd gluon exchange. It represents the involvement of all of 3, 5, 7 or any other odd numbers of gluons. The research was carried out by a team of over 100 physicists from 8 countries using the totem experiment located adjacent to the CMS particle detector. The totem experiment is designed to detect protons that aren't destroyed by particle collisions but are only slightly deviated. To do this, the totem particle detectors are placed a few millimetres from the outgoing beams of protons that didn't interact. By comparing current results with measurements made at lower energies using less powerful particle accelerators, totem's been able to make the most precise measurements ever. The authors compared the ratio of signatures from collisions at various energies to establish the Rio parameter, one of the measurements that helped build up evidence for the possible existence of odorons. You see, if you go into really high energies, there are signatures of the behaviour of beams collided at very high energies which can be measured. But the thing is, there are different types of high energy growth signatures. And up until now, scientists only had to think about one type of high energy growth behaviour. The Large Hadron Collider is operated by CERN, European Organisation for Nuclear Research. The facility includes a 27-kilometre underground ring below the Franco-Swiss border near Geneva. Packets of protons are fired around the ring in opposite directions, guided by superconducting cryogenically cooled magnets at speeds of within 99.999% the speed of light. At four strategic points around the ring, the proton beams can be made to collide and debris from those collisions can then be studied and measured, looking for new physics beyond the standard model. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. Astronomers have discovered 11 new stellar streams in our galaxy, the Milky Way. The findings were discovered in the first three years of data obtained through the Dark Energy Survey. Stellar streams are important because they're considered as evidence of the building blocks out of which our galaxy was formed. The Dark Energy Survey Collaboration is an international team of scientists, including researchers from the Australian Astronomical Observatory, whose primary goal is to better understand dark energy, a mysterious force believed to be causing the expansion of the universe to accelerate. The first three years of data from this survey includes information on more than 400 million astronomical objects, including distant galaxies billions of light years away, as well as stars in our own galaxy. The enormous Dark Energy Survey dataset includes hundreds of terabytes worth of images covering some 5,000 square degrees. That's one-eighth of the entire sky and includes more than 100,000 exposures. These data were obtained using the Dark Energy Camera, one of the world's most sensitive digital imaging devices mounted on the United States National Science Foundation's 4-metre Blanco telescope at the Inter-American Observatory in Chile. While the Dark Energy Survey was designed with the primary goal of understanding dark energy and its effect on the universe, astronomers have also discovered something new, not in the furthest reaches of the cosmos, but near our own Milky Way galaxy. As they were sifting through the very rich and deep Dark Energy Survey data, astronomers found 11 new stellar streams, or rivers of stars, moving through our own galaxy. These long, faint filaments of stars are orbiting at the edges of the galaxy and are remnants of dwarf galaxies or other clusters of stars that have been ripped apart by the huge gravitational tidal forces of the Milky Way. 
These stellar streams allow astronomers to interpret how the Milky Way may have evolved over the last 13 billion years. See, the Milky Way is grown by pulling in, ripping apart and absorbing these smaller star systems. As groups of stars are torn away from their original systems, they're stretched to form streams across the sky. The problem is stellar streams are extremely difficult to find because they're composed of relatively few stars which are stretched out over vast distances of the sky. Prior to these new discoveries by the Dark Energy Survey, only about two dozen stellar streams had been identified. Many of the brighter stellar streams were found by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, another large telescopic survey operating in the United States. But the fainter streams have avoided detection entirely until now. Due to the large field of view and extreme sensitivity of the dark energy camera, with just these three years of data from one single instrument, astronomers have already increased the number of known stellar streams by 50%. To find out more, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with Dr Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory. OK, Fred, now we're going to talk about your organisation, the AAO, the Australian Astronomical Observatory, because um, your um, facility or whatever you want to call it, has uh, just released uh, data about um, a river of stars. I've heard of a river of dreams and I've heard of a few other variations on the theme, but a river of stars sounds delightful. Yeah, they are. Technically, we call them stellar streams, which are streams of stars. So the idea is that out there in space, there are stars which are kind of moving in concert with one another. They're moving together, although sometimes they're spread out over quite large distances. We call them stellar streams. The idea has been known since the middle of the 20th century, but we believe that what's called the halo of our galaxy. And this is a a kind of spherical ball of stars which sits around and envelops the the disk of our galaxy. You know, we usually think our galaxy as as having this disk of stars and gas and dust, which has these beautiful spiral arms in it, um, something like 400 billion stars in the galaxy. But another component of the galaxy is what's called the halo. The halo is much fainter. We see them in other galaxies so that we know they exist. Mm. A halo of, I don't know, probably a few billion stars, maybe a few tens of billion stars, which form a sphere almost, a big spherical blob of stars around the disk of the galaxy. Now, we believe that halo actually grew, and in fact, the whole galaxy has probably grown by gobbling up other smaller galaxies. And I've worked on projects which have been designed to look for the evidence of some of those smaller galaxies, the sort of partially digested remains of them, if I can put it that way. (laughs) And we see these as streams of stars in the halo. Why are they streams because what happens is if you've got a a little galaxy that strays into the gravitational pull of our own galaxy, which is a big one, what happens is this little galaxy is following an orbit around the centre of our Milky Way galaxy, but the gravitational pull spreads the stars out along that orbit. So the stars of this poor little galaxy that's being gobbled up, stars are pulled one both ahead of it and behind it as it's dragged out into what really amounts to a line of stars streaming through space. Mm. And that's what we call the star stream. Why are they important to look for? Because it tells us about the way our galaxy has been put together. So going back a little bit, one of the projects I've worked on, something called RAVE, the Radial Velocity Experiment, about a decade ago, one of the first discoveries that was made from that was a stream of stars in the constellation of Aquarius. So it was called the Stream of Aquarius. In fact, that's um, that's rather apt. Aquarius being the water carrier. The water carrier, yeah, that's right. It's very, very appropriate. Mm. But other projects have also looked for these star streams. And in particular now, there's been a release of data from something called the Dark Energy Survey. Now, that's a survey being carried out, actually not with our telescope, but with a very similar one in Chile. It's called the Victor Blanco Telescope. It looks a lot like the Anglo-Australian Telescope in Coonabarabra, roughly the same size, a four-metre diameter mirror. And they have a camera on that that is looking very, very deep into space. And it's actually looking principally at distant galaxies. And that's so that we can work out some of the important attributes of the universe as a whole, and in particular, something called dark energy, which we think is a property of space itself. So that's what that project 
was designed to do. But incidentally, it also, as well as seeing galaxies, the limits of our detectability way, way in the depths of the universe, it also sees nearby things too. And in fact, it sees the stars of our galactic halo. And so an atlas has now been produced of the stars in the halo of our galaxy, these faint stars that basically, they don't really interfere with the view of the distant galaxies beyond, but they are there in the foreground. So we've got a catalogue of these stars, and it's that that has produced the evidence of, I think, 11 new streams of stars. It's really quite a dramatic uh, improvement. 11 new stellar streams around our own Milky Way galaxy. The reason why this is an AAO press release from our own organisation is that one of the key players in this, Kyla Kuhn, Dr. Kyla Kuhn, is one of our staff members. He's a, an important component of the Dark Energy Survey. So these streams of stars have now been named. And that's where it gets doubly interesting, Andrew, because yeah. it's not often that you can engage the public in naming celestial objects. There are very strict protocols about naming stars and things of that sort, all dictated by that august body known as the International Astronomical Union, the IAU. Hmm. Um, but Kyla and his colleagues have actually gone out with public talks and things of that sort to ask for suggestions for the names of these stellar streams. And what they've looked for is the traditional names for things like rivers and streams given by various indigenous peoples who are associated with the project, and in particular, indigenous names from Chile, where the telescope is, and Australia, where we are. So there are something like, uh, I think, something like six of them now have South American names, uh, Chilean names, but two of them have got Aboriginal names because of the Australian connection. Yeah. And they're going to blow my own trumpet here and tell you that I actually suggested one of them because it's a name name that's very familiar to us at the Anglo-Australian Telescope, that is Wombelong, mm. W-A-M-B-E-L-O-N-G, and it means crazy water in uh, Gamilla Ray, the, the of course, language of the indigenous people around the telescope. A couple of years ago, it was a crazy fire because it, it was, was a crazy a, fire, a that's huge exactly fire right. that uh, almost threatened to destroy your entire facility there, and it was it started in that particular creek, and that's why it was called the Wombelong Fire, and that's uh, exactly right. It destroyed ninety yeah. percent, uh, about ninety percent of the national park that um, surrounds you there uh, it was it was a horrific fire um, the only good thing that came out of it was that no people died as a result yeah but lots of property losses lots of stock and na native animal losses it was horrific That's uh, right. so it's good that the name can be turned around for a positive thing Indeed, that's correct. And that was one, one of the reasons that I had in mind uh, when I said, why don't you call it Wombelong? And that then went to a public vote, which um, the people liked it. Um, just to, as an aside there regarding the fire, it's only a few days ago, Andrew, as we're speaking, that we commemorated, rather than celebrated, commemorated the fifth anniversary of that fire. It took place on the 13th of January 2013, five years ago. Gee, that's gone um, fast. Yeah. It's gone fast, hasn't it? And the landscape still bears the scars of it. The observatory, as you correctly said was under serious threat but we came through that thanks largely to the the water bombing efforts of the rural fire mm. service. They, they saved um, my radio transmitters too. I was working for a radio uh, station that had tr transmitters uh, on the next mountain to yours yes, and that's right. they were yeah. under threat. We we thought we'd lose them but they uh, they saved them as well. But uh, yeah. yeah, so re remarkable stuff. So it's great that that name of Wombalong is actually being now preserved in the heavens. There is a stellar stream whose official name is Wombalong and the other Aboriginal name actually comes from the Darug people not very far from where our headquarters are in Sydney in the Lane Cove region. It's actually the name for the Lane Cove River in that language. It is Turrenburra and so that is the other star stream that has now been discovered, the two with Aboriginal names. It's a very nice story. It is. And I'm, I'm delighted that they've commemorated these things in the heavens in that way. And we're naming the streams after streams, which I like as well. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah. So the same is true with the Chilean names. There's various meanings like quiet water and crossing rivers and sacred water. Their names, too, are uh, connected with water. Yeah, well, one of theirs is jumping out at me because um, I'm thinking it's probably not quiet water if it's named Turbio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, Actually, that's, that's the Spanish name, Turbio. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, pro probably means it's uh, pretty, pretty treacherous. Yes, indeed. And, and one final thought, uh, now that... 
uh, all these star streams have de- been discovered, it, it, it sounds ne- like that, that they are a fair, fairly common phenomenon. That's correct. We think that the halo itself has been, the galactic halo has been put together by basically all these gobbled up mini galaxies which have formed stellar streams. And in fact, back in the early days of the Ray project, the one I mentioned earlier that I was working on, in about 2003, some of my colleagues produced a simulation of the halo of our galaxy based on it having gobbled up 100, 100 mini galaxies. So there are 100 star streams in there. And actually what you get is something that looks a lot like what we find. And it's only now, though, that we've got the sensitivity and instruments to be able to unravel those individual star streams and see them kind of mapped out on the sky, which is, I think, very exciting. That's Dr. Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. NASA has confirmed a satellite spotted last month is the agency's long-lost image of Magnetopause to Aurora Global Exploration, or IMAGE, spacecraft. IMAGE was launched from the Vandenberg Air Force Base in California aboard a Delta II rocket on March 25th in the year 2000. It was designed to study the dynamics of plasma in Earth's magnetosphere. And after successfully completing its primary mission in 2002, IMAGE was on an extended mission when it unexpectedly suddenly went quiet failing to make contact with mission managers during a routine pass on December the 18th, 2005. After the 2007 solar eclipse failed to induce a reboot, the mission was declared over. At least that was until it was spotted by an amateur satellite spotter who detected radio signals coming from the spacecraft back on January the 20th this year. NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, then coordinated the use of five separate antennas to try and acquire more signals from the object. And by January the 29th, all five sites had confirmed the signals matched those of the image spacecraft. Oscillation of the signal was also consistent with the last known spin rate for image. Finally, on the afternoon of January the 30th, the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab at Laurel, Maryland, successfully collected telemetry data from the spacecraft. The signal showed that the spacecraft ID was 166, the ID for image. NASA has now been able to read some basic housekeeping data from the spacecraft, suggesting that at least the main control system is still operational. Scientists and engineers at Goddard will now try to continue analysing the data from the spacecraft to learn more about its operational state. But the process will take a week or two to complete, because it requires attempting to adapt old software and databases of information to more modern systems. NASA will next attempt to capture and analyse data from the signal. The challenge for decoding the signal is primarily technical. The types of hardware and operating systems used in the Image Mission Operations Centre no longer exist, and other systems have been updated several versions beyond what they were at that time, requiring significant reverse engineering. If the data coding is successful, NASA will try to turn the science payload back on, and that will help them understand the status of the various science instruments. And then, pending the outcome of these activities, NASA will decide on how to proceed. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. China has launched a new satellite testing a potential earthquake early warning system which could save thousands of lives a year. The new Zhangheng-1 seismoelectromagnetic satellite was placed into a 500 km high orbit by a Long March 2D rocket launched from the Zhaiquan Satellite Launch Center. The project follows hints in satellite data that Earth's crust may be emitting electromagnetic anomalies which are detectable in the ionosphere before large tremors occur. The 730kg probe is designed to look for these possible ionospheric precursors using an array of particle, magnetic and electric field and plasma sensors. And it's an international effort, with the Italian Space Agency providing the high-energy particle detector instrument used in the experiment. The satellite is based on a CAS-2000 platform carrying enough fuel for a five-year mission. As well as the primary payload, the mission also carried the LF-1 imaging constellation operated by Satellogic, the twin GOMEX 4A and 4B satellites studying intersatellite communications and station keeping, and two Chinese technology demonstrator CubeSats. 
A SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket has launched a new telecommunications satellite for Luxembourg's military. The mission blasted off from Space Launch Complex 40 at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Base in Florida. The 4,230kg GovSat-1 was built by Orbital ATK using a Geostar 3 platform and carries enough fuel for a 15-year lifespan. The telecommunications payload consists of both X and KA band transponders equipped with military-grade anti-jamming systems. As well as serving the Luxembourg military, GovSat-1 will also support the municipality's civilian government. After the launch, instead of returning to a drone ship or to ground-based landing zone hard stands at Cape Canaveral, the Falcon 9's core stage was instead allowed to land in the ocean, apparently surviving its waterborne splashdown. India has successfully launched a new Earth observation satellite. The 710kg Cutasat 2 series spacecraft was launched aboard a PSLV or Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle from the Shatish Dhawan Space Centre on the Bay of Bengal coast. Cutasat 2 is an advanced remote sensing satellite designed to provide scene-specific spot imagery for detailed mapping and other cartographic applications. The spacecraft uses a panchromatic camera with a spatial resolution of under a metre. As well as the primary payload, the mission also carried 30 smaller satellites. These included 4 micro and 26 nano satellites for Canada, Finland, France, South Korea, the UK, India and the United States. Japan has launched an experimental radar imaging satellite aboard the third flight of its Epsilon rocket. The Esnaro-2 spacecraft was launched from the Yuchinora Space Center south of Tokyo. Epsilon is a solid-fueled rocket designed to carry small scientific payloads up to 1.2 tons into low Earth orbit. In reality, the Epsilon's first stage is actually one of the solid rocket boosters from an H-2A rocket, Japan's primary launch vehicle. The second and third stages of the Epsilon utilise the solid fuel-powered upper stages of the now discontinued Japanese MV rocket. And an optional solid fuel-powered fourth stage can also be included in the stack configuration in order to reach higher altitudes when needed. The Epsilon placed the SNRO-2 into a 505km high near circular sun-synchronous orbit. The 570kg spacecraft is based on a Nexstar NX300L modular platform. It uses an X-band synthetic aperture radar capable of operating in three different observational modes. The spotlight mode focuses on a small area of the Earth's surface, providing resolutions down to under a metre. The strip mapping mode images a 12 km wide strip of the ground below the flight path with a resolution of around 2 metres. And the scanning mode images a 50 km wide path with a resolution of 16 metres. Meanwhile, JAXA has used a modified sounding rocket to create what's now considered the world's smallest satellite launch vehicle. The SS-520-5 rocket blasted off from the Yuchinora Space Center in southern Japan carrying the shoebox-sized Tricom-1R three-unit CubeSat into orbit. Developed by the University of Tokyo, the Tricom-1R is a three-kilogram geological surveillance and data relay satellite. The 9.5 metre tall SS520-5 is a solid fuel powered rocket based on the two stage SS520-4 sounding rocket with an extra stage added to allow it to go high enough and fast enough to reach orbit. Sounding rockets are usually used to deliver small scientific payloads on ballistic suborbital trajectories allowing them to be in space for a few minutes before the arc of their flight path brings them back down into Earth's atmosphere. Well, Russia is certainly celebrating as it successfully launched its third rocket from the nearest Koshny Cosmodrome in the country's Far East. It was a case of third time lucky for Moscow, with the Soyuz 21A carrying two Russian Canopus 5 Earth observation satellites, as well as nine smaller German and American spacecraft into low Earth orbit. The flight, Moscow's first for the year, comes in the wake of last November's disastrous launch from Viskoshny, which resulted in the crash and burn of a Soyuz rocket carrying a new multi-million dollar weather satellite. The Russian Federal Space Agency Roscosmos says this flight involved a complex sequence of engine burns by the frigate upper stage to place all 11 satellites into their correct orbits. You're listening to Space Time, I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio, and as part of Virgin Australia's In-Flight Entertainment. 
If you want more space time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash spacetime with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 